So we'll come back now to discuss fructose in a bit more detail. So table sugar is a combination of glucose and fructose. Remember, carb complex carbohydrates are just glucose, a whole lot of them put together, and that's what they get broken down into. When you eat foods containing table sugar, it gets broken down into fructose and glucose. And let's have a look at now how they're treated differently by the body. So when it enters the body, the two molecules are split. Remember, yellow was glucose, red was fructose, so we keep the coding the same. About 80% of the glucose gets taken up by these cells, which you know, don't need insulin really to get them in. So the brain, the red blood cells, kidney, um, and we discussed uh, a few of the others as well. But you, know, you get an insulin spike, you get some fat storage, you get some muscle storage. What happens to the fructose? Well, the fructose is almost exclusively processed in the liver. This overwhelms the liver in terms of actual um, energy available. It tries to store it as glycogen. The glycogen becomes full. And basically what happens is the kitchen cupboards are now full. It overflows. So the liver now has to do something with it. It turns it into fat. It gets stored in the liver as fat. You get a fatty liver. And eventually what happens is that fat starts to overflow into your blood and you get a rise in your triglycerides. So really, this is just overflowing with the kitchen cupboards. So since the glycogen stores are full, you also get high uric acid levels, which is the cause of gout, high fat in your blood, that's triglycerides, and that can be deposited in inflamed cell walls. So in terms of developing insulin resistance, fructose is actually more potent than glucose by itself. What this means is for well-fed people, almost all of the fructose we eat goes straight to the production of triglycerides and fats. Now, if we were glycogen depleted, eating the fructose wouldn't be too much of a problem. But we're very well-fed. We have, we have full kitchen cupboards. So when the kitchen cupboards are full, the fructose is a problem. To make matters worse, the rate of glycation, not glycosylation, but glycation, is seven times greater with fructose than what it is with glucose. The only good thing about that is our fructose levels are far lower than what our glucose levels are. But you really need to avoid fructose if you're well fed and you want to avoid AGEs. So this means table sugar and high fructose corn syrup are particularly dangerous for us in terms of our metabolic health. Complex carbohydrates become glucose, maltose, glucose and galactose gets converted to glucose, but fructose is converted to glucose a little bit. And a lot of people tell you that fructose is safe to eat because it doesn't cause an insulin response. And it doesn't cause an insulin response. But that's not where the problem is. The problem is the fat production that's caused by the fructose, and that's called the polyol pathway, which we'll talk about in a little while. So everyone knows that fruit is healthy, right? And by extension, fruit juice must be healthy as well, right? Well, the problem is that you've taken all the fiber out of it. So I could quite happily eat one apple or one orange, but I could quite happily drink six or eight apples or oranges just straight down. And what's that going to do? It's going to give you a major spike in your fructose um, and lead to all of these negative effects. So um, the basic message with this is eat your fruit seasonally like what the bear does. Eat fruit when you want to get fat, and then don't eat it when you don't want to get fat. And don't drink your fruit. So if we look at fat burning versus glucose burning, changing tack slightly. At the level of the mitochondria in the cell, if you are a glucose eater, about half of what's burned in the mitochondria is glucose, and about half of what's burned in the mitochondria is fatty acids. So that's this pathway down over here. Um, if you become a fat burner, that ratio changes, and it goes to probably about 80% fat and 20% glucose. So even if you're on a low-carb, high-fat diet, you're still burning glucose at a cellular level. The only reason I've put this up here of the citric acid cycle is just to point out something to you. There are critical ingredients around that cycle with which the cycle can't continue. So if you're missing any one of those products, particularly this one here, oxaloacetate, the citric acid cycle will shut down. So I'm going to come back to that now. We're going to go through this slowly. This is a very important slide. 
This is a normal fat burning state. Carbohydrates become acetyl CoA, which go into the citric acid cycle. Remember, I mentioned oxaloacetate was one of those critical features. And that's how you produce energy for the organs that need them. Now, if we stop eating carbohydrates, what happens? Well, our body doesn't have the acetyl CoA to go into the citric acid cycle, so it says, okay, I need acetyl CoA from somewhere else. You get some breakdown of fat beta oxidation, it puts it into the citric acid cycle, everything's all right. But you're now not eating glucose. So your body says, well, I need glucose for some of my cells. I'm now going to make my own glucose. As I said to you, you don't need glucose. The body can make it. And that's called gluconeogenesis. What does gluconeogenesis do? It uses up some of your oxaloacetate. Now the citric acid cycle can't function as well because the oxaloacetate's depleted. So you get a build-up at this point over here. And the body says, OK, well, look, I've got to do something with acetyl-CoA, and I need some ATP. And what it does is produces ketones. Where do the ketones go? They provide you with energy. So this is a really important slide. So I'm going to start again with this one, all right? I'm going to go through this one again because it's hard to grasp this sometimes. Carbohydrate metabolism, acetyl-CoA, citric acid, ATP. You cut out the carbohydrates. You don't have the acetyl-CoA. Your body says, I'm going to make my own glucose. And it does this very efficiently. And it does it by using up the oxaloacetate. The oxaloacetate causes the acetyl-CoA down here to have nowhere to go because it can't go effectively into the citric acid cycle. You produce ketones and you get your energy from the ketones. So if we look at the ketone bodies, they're transported from the liver to other tissues where acetoacetate and beta-hydroxyapatite can be reconverted into acetyl-CoA to produce energy. This can be from fat that you eat or from your fat stores. So unlike free fatty acids, Ketone bodies can cross the blood-brain barrier, and they're available to your brain as fuel. And a lot of people say you shouldn't be cutting your carbs because your brain has to have glucose. Well, it's true, but the body will make the glucose that the brain needs. After the diet's been changed to lower carbohydrate levels, after about three days, the, body get, the brain gets about 25% of its energy from ketones, and after about four days, this goes up to 70%. So those people that are eating ketogenic diets, there are a few people in the room, myself, Paul, we're getting about 70% of our brain energy from ketones, not from glucose. And we're still standing here perfectly fine. So can we measure it? Well, yes, we can. And that's another thing that we do at the clinic. The level of ketone bodies in our bloodstream can be measured. Um, and the level of ketone bodies reflects the amount of fat that's being broken down. The larger the number, the more fat that's being broken down. So the state of nutritional ketosis is another way of saying that we're putting the bo body into a state where it can burn fat for energy. Now, while it's possible to drink exogenous ketones, you need to understand that the body's used to only having ketones around in a low insulin, low glucose environment. So we don't know what the effect of drinking these ketones is going to be in the long run. All right? And I'm certainly not going to experiment with myself to find out if it's safe or not over a five or ten year period. There's also a negative feedback loop if you're trying to lose weight. The body sees the ketones as an energy source. It says, OK, I've got enough energy. I don't need to break down my fat anymore to make the ketones. And so if you're drinking ketones, you're going to stop fat burning. Personally, I also have an issue that most of the products have caffeine and sweeteners in them, and I don't like either of those products from a weight loss and health perspective. 